Good morning, oh, and welcome to your daily game face. Wow, all I hear is I gotta go fix how that loud now. this is in here. And so Lou's going to come fix this because I am having Good lots morning. of feedback. Oh, I know, you right? hear me? I can. So everyone that's listening, I'm having so triple feedback. We're having a moment. Oh, thank goodness. Thank you for that. Oh, good morning and welcome to your daily game phase. There's Lou on my screen. If you didn't know what Lou looked like, now that's what he looks like. And I'm um, so uh, excited. This is what but happens yet, when I'm not the only person in the studio. Yes. Exciting but very disappointed this morning. Yes. <laughs> Lou, I'm going to try to keep this contained. <laughs> That's okay. No. So our you don't wonderful? need to keep it contained. Okay, I'm here. not going to keep it contained. You know space. why? Because I'm a human being. That's right. And I have to just say, yes, I'm going to be real. I came in this morning. I was way early. I was so jacked for this. I had read the book. I've listened to the book. I've taken notes for two weeks, almost three weeks. I had my stuff ready. And 15 minutes ago, <laughs> the excitement of having our wonderful authors of The Genius of Athletes, what olympic level or what um elite athletes can teach you as a normal authors? person canceled what who are the authors i'm not saying <laughs> <laughs> i just want to know if you had it <laughs> of course i know the authors dr noel brick and scott douglas but i'm still upset because i'm disappointed <laughs> so today's going to be a lesson in dr kim figuring out how to manage disappointment which i'm going to be over in like 30 seconds but nonetheless i have to say that Oh, I was so prepared and so excited and have so many things to talk about. And So yeah. first of all, you said you're a human being. I am. But you're a talk show host, so that kind well, of I'm diminishes a that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, thanks. <laughs> I am a human being, and be I was disappointed. Question? What was going to be a lead-off question? Um, my lead-off question depended on what they were talking about, but I had a series of them in my head. Yeah. But well, you had to have a first question. Um. Yes, Mm-hmm. How did you two get together? Oh, yeah. Okay. Good one. Because I, I can't find that really anywhere. So I don't know how they got together because one of them is in Ireland and one of them's in Maine. PhDs can write too, right? Why would he need an author? Well, thank you because I did write my own stuff and got published. I mean, you do a lot of writing. I you do. get your PhD. There's I a thesis. Do. There's, yes. They're not, we have they're to not be strangers published. We have to, to do research. Well, you know what's interesting, I think. He could have paid an in, editor and kept the name. Well, yes, but I think that it was, I think, now here, we don't have them here to talk about it, but one of the things about being in the position that Dr. Brick, the man who did the research for the book that we're going to eventually talk about, which we're talking about now, um, and Scott, they they both are runners. They're both ultra-marathoners and marathoners, and Scott, who lives in Maine, actually writes for Runner's, Runner's World, and so he actually has done over a thousand marathons or something or he's thousand. a new england guy and he yeah. still stiffed us i don't think he's done a thousand marathons. i think a thousand yeah. miles or a hundred no a hundred thousand miles okay. sorry for my yep. numbers a hundred thousand miles since 1979 on the roads so he writes and he's a writer for like the atlantic the washington post he does health and fitness he does a lot of the stuff i do yeah but he does it really around running and athletes and i believe that somehow they got connected probably because of the same conferences that I go to that um, yeah. Noel goes to and we, weird thing Noel and I I think presented at the exact same conference at one point on the same type of topic I was presenting on shame and coaching and how to um, get elite level athletes to not feel shame um, and what type of coaching creates that and what type of coaching doesn't and I think he was doing something on endurance athletes at mm-hmm. the same time at the same conference in my research um, that we did but he's over in Ulster University over in England or UK and he um, he's very focused on uh, attention and understanding how to maintain and focus your attention during your endurance athlete events such as running um he they heavily focus on running but the book itself has tennis golf um i think bowling maybe reference maybe that was something else um swimming um you know they they use lots of great stories and really interesting things to bring it all together so it's it's actually an interesting read just i mean it has a lot of the standard stuff that i talk about in terms of how to bring that mental attitude you know your mental game essentially to your life instead of it being you don't have to be an elite athlete which is their premise of their book you don't have to be an elite world-class athlete to be able to function at a top level and not be like the middle ground or mediocre. Mm-hmm. Like all the things I talk about of being your best self, they put it into this book with these anecdotal little application pieces that are really good. Well, the main tenant, oh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, I will correct you if you're wrong. You're the pro and I'm not. The main 
attribute of mental health, the nucleus of mental health, the mission critical skill of mental health is attenuating focus. Yes. Uh, that's everything. Yes. You learn to attenuate your focus, you've won the game. And, and So yes, y and that has little subsets to it. So mm -hmm. attenuating focus in different areas. So is it attenuating focus internally, externally? What, you know, if you're... So whatever your mind is, is predominated by. Right. Is right. that a word, predominated? Yeah. Yes. And, and, and so, and it's like what they talk, they talk about this in the book. There's two little pieces that I really caught on was they consistently keep referencing mindfulness, which I think is one of the hardest concepts for people. It is. In life to get what that means. And then living, It's funny. It's so, it's, it's like riding attention. a bike. When, right. Once and, you get it, you go, oh my God, why didn't I have this before? It's so, so simple, but it's tough to get there. Well, I th and I think that the words I have, I have a couple clients that are wonderful in telling me how the the concept is clear, but the actual words get in the way and muddy the waters. So when you when I say be mindful, yeah. I can't use that word with them, and use the and I have stopped using the word intention or living with intention um, with one particular client because she struggles. I won't say she struggles, but maybe that's the right word. But she for some reason it just gets in the way so it so there's these words but they write about and talk about the you know focus uh intention mindfulness all those attentional things yeah people and, roll their eyes when you start and, using and those well words. because yeah. and yeah. here's the thing that was one of my pieces i'm going to talk to them about if 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 they ever come back <laughs> to the show is is this is where i struggle with my patients because I get it. I know you get it. And I know a lot of people that I work with, especially certainly elite athletes. And by get it, get I it. have the concept. It's not perfect. You're not right. there and all it's, the time. And it's always yeah. moving. And so yeah. what I thought was really interesting was the, the concept of flow. Another eye roller for a lot of people is because you, you have to be able to take an example. Like if you're in the zone yeah. or you have, that's flow. If you're in the zone and people say, well, I'm not an athlete, so I don't have that. Yes, you do. Yeah. If you're like uh, at your desk and you're in the middle of a project and you're writing something and you're getting something done and it's firing off and it's going ref left and right and you're just hot and on fire, that's the zone for a person at work. That is being in the moment, in the yeah. zone, doing the same thing as an athlete at that level does because you're, you're accomplishing, you're reaching the next thing, you're being mindful because that means you're being present. Right. You're being. You're living with intention, which means you're having a purpose in the moment. Um, all those things that bring you into the zone, just like a person out on the field who you know can block out everything and run, you know, and do whatever they need to do on whatever sport they're doing. Right. So that concept of how to apply, which is the thing I like about the book, um, is to utilize all those tools in a way that combines them all by showing the examples like I do here and I do in my own patient work, but they just wrote it in a different kind of way. So, um, but they're not here to talk about it. Do I keep saying that? The example, the example that I use all the time trying to get this concept across to people is think of your happiest moments. Pull out two or three of your happiest moments. And those happiest moments have one thing in common. It's that you weren't worried about work. You weren't worried about home. You weren't on your phone. You weren't elsewhere. You were there. Right. You were just there, and everything was what was going on there, and there was no outside noise. There was nothing wrangling your attention. You were just there. Those, and if right. you pull out a happy moment, I challenge you to pull out your happiest moment. You, you'll say that, that's, that was the point of it. I was just there. There was nothing else going on, and I was there. Right. So now here's the thing. Now, so on my side, I'd say, yes, that's great as a technique. And what I find is... Now here's a differentiation no, but that's getting the between concept an athlete, across the people. Uh, between yeah. like the athlete that they're comparing to and a person who has to be trained in doing that. When I ask someone to find their happiest moment, they can do it. Most people can't. It's like think of a lemon and what happens, right? You can it, it makes your mouth water. It's the association memory. It's those mirror neurons. It's all that stuff going in your brain. But then to conjure up the feeling and hold it, to then bring it forward. Now an athlete, can, an athlete, as you know, that's you know, even like at the recreational level that's doing it all the time and consistent, they can bring themselves into that moment, even if they're, you know, okay. the last on the team, so to speak, because they can still do it at least a little bit. But when people either have not played a sport or they don't know what it's like to be in the zone because they haven't identified it that or they haven't really had that experience to say, hey, that's what this is. When you say visualize your happiest moment or think about your happiest moment and then hold on to it and now let's figure out how to put that into this, this, and this. Well, I'm just using it to demonstrate it. the principle of being yes. in the moment. Your happiest moments 
your happiest times, you were in the moment. That one or two memories that comes up yes. in your head every time, that was an in the moment situation yes. right there. And those are and you can create that. It's not everyone goes seeking that. They go traveling or they do whatever the hell they do to right. try to create those moments, but you can create it yourself and it's about attenuating your focus. Right. It's about exactly. being able to put down everything for a little while, whether it's and I remember when I was struggling the worst, it was like um, I'm just going to, I need an hour. Mm. This is just going to be my hour. Right. Everything else come back. I'm just going to set it all down for a while. And whether it was watching Baywatch or, oh, you know. <laughs> oh, we haven't had a Baywatch <laughs> reference in so long. We didn't I haven't watched make it. it in so mm. long, actually. But what, uh, what I was Good thinking Lord. of, what I was thinking of at that time was guys with football yes. on Sunday. That's an in-the-moment situation. You watch the Patriots for three hours. Yep. All you care about is the game. Yes. You don't care about the you know the water leaking in the bathroom you don't care about what's going on at work for three hours you watch the game i think that's why and people uh people denigrate video games a lot i think video games are good in the moment well get you in the moment wait a second so because you just said a whole bunch of stuff give me a second jeez man (laughs) (sighs) um so the video game phenomenon right for people with add Oftentimes, I'll have parents who have not had a kid or their or or even adults that haven't been diagnosed officially. They'll say, "Yeah, but I have no problem, or my kid has no problem sitting in front of the TV playing video games for seven or eight hours." Right. Yeah. Exactly. That should be your first sign, <laughs> because usually, not all the time, but usually, when there's a person that has the attentional affliction, that's they can focus, they can attenuate their focus on that one thing. And because the video game is so stimulating and so intense, it keeps the brain focused right right there and center. Because what it does is in a brain that has attentional issues, that brain, the way I describe it to clients is the brain has a thousand televisions going on at the same time. And when you go and narrow it down and you bring it in front of you on one screen and everything, it turns all those TVs off or down and brings it right to center, and everything is channeled, everything's firing into that. So that's why a kid or an adult can hold their attention either on a TV show, mostly yep. on video games, and why video games become a crutch, because parents and other people think, well, they're watching, they can do that for hours, so they don't have that. No, that's actually a hallmark sign that they might have that. I say that because not all yeah. people do, but... <clears throat> can you imagine how peaceful that is for them? Can well, you imagine right. how, so, what a relief that is for them? And so you have to imagine in people that don't have ADD, if you've ever stood in front of, oh, I'm going to date myself. Remember Woolworths? Yeah. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> Remember the front, you know, and you go to New York City, you can still see this in, the, all in the Manhattan, All the TVs right? in the windows? All the TVs in the windows. Yep. Imagining that, all, and you're just constantly looking around, looking for, or trying to listen and get out all the noise, and then bring it down to one TV. That's what an ADD brain does. Yeah. So, and that's what, when someone takes medication for it, it brings it down to the one-ish. If you run or do exercise, it takes, it does the same thing as the video game. The problem with the attenuation of a video game for someone, even without ADD, is that what it's doing neurologically is it's rewiring the brain. And I often talk about the rewiring of a brain is that it ends up becoming addicted just like in any other substance or anything because it's changing the way the brain yeah. functions at baseline so anytime you're adding too much of that in that's stimulating and no other things to attenuate that then it becomes um an imbalance in the focus um, which is why kids when they go away from it they have to go to school and focus on the math they're like well this isn't stimulating because nothing's there anymore because the brain right. has rewired itself to look for the constant stim 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 so that all the TVs go back on yep. and math is one of those TVs and it's just irrelevant just lost everyone has this though Wh- yes. whether it's video games whether it's a soap opera whether it's a, a TV show soap opera. <laughs> whatever it is they have it the two most common ones are showers and driving those I do my best thinking driving and running yeah because there is, because there's nothing else to think about. You can't have your phone in the shower with you. You're not on your phone while you're driving. You just, Listen, I have actually known people that can put their phone in the shower and yeah, take see, it with them. See, now that's a problem. See, that's a problem, that's, right? That's just a that's a red flag, right? And there. wait, don't say that you don't. People drive and text and are on the phone I all know. the time. That's a red flag too. People I, get this is yes. People get pissed at me because it's like I just I don't answer the phone in the car. I don't I don't respond to messages. Well, you don't answer the phone when you're sitting yeah, here. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I call you. I know. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Who are you kidding, my friend? Yeah. 
The only two people I answer the phone for are my kids and my son never calls. So <laughs> good to know that I didn't make that list. Thanks. Um, <laughs> he called the other day and he's trained. I've trained both of them. When he calls, like the first thing he said in, in the voice message, because I, I didn't see the call. I would have picked up, but I didn't see the call. And the first thing in his voice message was, there's no emergency. I just wanted to talk to you about something. And it's like, because he knows. If he's calling me, I'm going, what the hell's going on? Are you doing right. a car wreck? Right. At the bottom of a ravine somewhere? Oh, that's it? nice. Go yeah. right to the negative spot. <laughs> okay. So coming back. Yeah. God love your son, but let's come back. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's the, attenuate our focus. So, <laughs> you're killing me. Today is going to be the show of being slap happy because we lost our guest. We're getting good work done. Here. I know. Yeah. Um, but mindfulness. Okay, so let's go back to that for a second mm -hmm. because the concept in the book, and if you, and honestly, as long as they come on the show, yay, I'm going to promote the book, so they better get back on the show. <laughs> but they have a really good section on applying. I think Dr. Brick puts a really good spin on it and similar to what I do in my practice. But for people that haven't had the benefit of going to a therapist or a sports psych person or anything like we do, to really get a good concept of how to real-time mindfulness. Because mindfulness has the stigma, which is what I was going to talk to you. It has that, oh, it's kind of voodoo schmoodoo. It's got that right. like throwback to the 70s, whatever it is. Yeah. It's got this thing to it. But in fact, you know, mindfulness as a technique in, in um industrial organizational psych to help business so hr departments hr departments essentially if we can put it real time are all based on this concept that they write about in this book they're how to make people have their best lives at work and then people like me how to make you have your best life at home work you know so it's it's taking the concept of mindfulness right. and change and it's take the word off the table and say how do you be super present in the moment by you know hearing seeing tasting touching whatever it is that's going on to make sure that you are in the flow the zone this the presence or whatever and a lot of people still get caught up in that that, that doesn't make sense and, right. and what does that mean and i can't do that but you do it all the time to your point with oh think of your happy moments or think of something but people don't hang on to those things and that's where i find and this would be one of my questions is if do do they find like I find with patients and other people and even my friends people don't hang on to that because it loses the meaning or they don't make any meaning out of it right. as how to transfer it over to make themselves happier or more balanced you know they think it's external when it's right. internal right and yeah. so like so the example which is why we laughed about it and I said I'm talking about disappointment today and all the things <laughs> that make me disappointed well because and and I said thirty seconds later I'll be over it because it's that in, it's not personal it's not the end of the world it doesn't ruin the day there's wonderful things I can still talk about it I have a benefit that I actually got to read the book hear about the book did all this stuff so now I've got the, <laughs> I'm charged up so it's a benefit to me so I found that positive place of doing that whereas a lot of times as you heard in the beginning I said people could say. Ah, oh, I wasted my time. I shouldn't have done that. What a ridiculous, you know, all the negative things that come with it, which is what many people do, which is losing your mindfulness. You're not yep. staying present in the moment with no one's died. The end of the day didn't come. You have to have flexibility. It, what are you doing over there? Lou, are you, are you even listening? Stuff. You're not being mindful. Everyone that cannot see I'm Lou. I'm listening. Lou is I'm not. Tech, I'm keeping the ship in the air. You're keeping the ship <laughs> in the air. Yeah. Lou wasn't paying attention. No. I'm talking okay, to the so air. The Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, mindfulness. <laughs> Go ahead. The key principle of all this, and again, it comes down to external or internal. The key principle for me, what turned the switch for me, was um, uh, the observer position. And yes. it's called a bunch of things in a, in a bunch of different... Um, now you just lost everybody in the world around you because everyone's like, what's that? And I always yeah. explain this, but go ahead, you explain it. Well, okay, let's, I'll try to work with your example that we started okay. with the show with of the Woolworths window with all the TVs, right? Yes. You're not any of those signals. What's competing for your attention right. is your mind. Right. And your yes. mind yes, is, you're right. your mind is uh, throwing threats at you all the time. Yes. That, that's its job. It's to keep you alive. So anything that presents a threat to you, it throws at you. As I've been doing it since we did this show, I've disco I discovered it on this show, and I like it. It's like walking your dog. But people, because uh, your dog is barking all the time, you're not your dog. 
you're not your mind. You have to under, you have to right. get into the observer position to right. understand that those things that the mind is throwing at you, and listen and right. hear that statement again. Your mind is throwing at you. You are not your mind. Too many people swim in their mind. Well, because they, and they think don't they know don't the have difference. control over it. Yeah. And so the observer position is basically me saying in simpler terms, because people get that concept wrapped up with mindfulness, the observer position is you being able to step back and look at yourself and really being um, <laughs> observing. I can't think of a better word. It's observing. You're observing yourself yep. from above, around, inside, and inside so that you're really aware of what's going on. And that's a hard thing. And I'm not saying that to be negative, but this I always bring up that other side because that's what I hear a lot because people come because they, they come to me because they struggle with that. Athletes, people in business, yep. people who are trying to just work through their lives on daily, like you know, just normal stuff, uh, you know, day to day stuff. Is your that process, they don't stay present. Your process this morning was a perfect example of it. You came in and you said, "I'm disappointed." You're not disappointed. You feel disappointed. Right. Your mind is throwing right. that disappointment at you. Right. But you're you got to be able to get in a position of, well, am I really? Right. I mean, I. You know, and you just kind of deal with well, it. Well, after I beat on you a little bit, yeah. then I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just took out the anger. No. But all those things, all those TV sets, all those competing yeah. stimulus, yeah. all the things that's drawing your attention for the moment are your mind, cre is your mind creating things? Right. Right? Basically. Right. And listen, sometimes you listen, you should listen to it. Well, there's, certainly. There's no doubt about it. Well, because your mind, your mind also gives you good intuition, the knowledge that you already have to make sure you protect yourself from some things but yeah but going to the example of just disappointment is you know and, we're, and of course we're socially trained into saying you know i'm disappointed instead of i feel disappointed which is right. obviously you know because the difference between people who say i feel that you i feel that you aren't being nice yeah. that is not a feeling that is a telling someone that they're not being nice <laughs> yeah. i feel sad when you're not nice to me i feel disappointed because my guests didn't show and said they weren't coming. <laughs> telling someone oh. that they're not being nice. Yep. I feel and now I've got sad. the, now Did I have the. Can you mute that or do I have to come back in? Somehow the volume came back on in my room over here and I can't hear myself talk because I'm on delay, Lou, and I don't know why it came on. Would you like to fix it for me? Somehow the volume came back on in my room over here. Why did that come back? I don't know, but I just clicked it. Oh, good. I, just, I found it. But thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know. I just clicked it, though, because I saw it over there. And I'm like, oh, I can click that off. So this is an interesting day. See, look at this. We're having all kinds of things thrown at me. Today. See, my ghost show would have said that was that was spirits <laughs> in here. That was very odd. I'm like, mm, my hands are sitting here, and I'm... Anyway, sorry about it's kinda, that. It's kind of... When you go to the theater and you're watching a movie... Yes. You don't get involved in the movie. The movie's throwing stimulus at you, but you understand that you're separate. You're not in the movie. You, you immerse yourself to a certain extent, but you keep your observer position you keep your separation from everything that's going on in the movie the technique is to do the same thing with your mind understand that your mind is your mind and you are two different things so so always playing devil's advocate because yeah. i 100 percent agree with this so because you, you know you act oftentimes on on that seat as in the um therapy role therapist role and i always throw at you the well, this is what a client would say, right? right? So I have multiple clients over the years and still present day that will tell you that they want to go to the movies, for instance, so I'm using the observer thing, and that's where they escape to not be an observer. So they don't get that concept to be able to wrap their minds around it because it's a great way to you know, use the analogy. And also where I have people that will tell me that they are, that they are, they, they relate, they're in the movie with it. Oh, so, you, you, empathize. Know, so it's like, you empathize, but you don't. Well, you're yeah, not well, running yes, screaming out of the empathize, theater, right? you know, like the, yeah. you know, bring up feelings, but yeah. people get lost in it. And the reason, the reason why I bring that up is because people lose or not even lose. They don't activate. That's a better word. They don't activate the ability to actually have control. They don't think they have control. They just become part of the next thing instead of it. Like they went to the movies, they saw the movie, they cried, they yeah. got upset, they whatever. And then, and then they moved on to the next thing and say, instead of, actively thinking ah oh, i'm watching this this is such a relief there's no mindfulness about the experience um because it's work you yeah. know it's work and that's one of the reasons why i think it's a turnoff to a lot of 
um, my clients, uh, my, my, I shouldn't say that because my clients are pretty good at doing the mindfulness thing because I start them right out of the gate with let's be present, let's be present, let's be present. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't know what your body is doing, your mind is doing, your, well, how they're talking to each other, then you, this is why you're in the predicament that you're in. So, um, and most people that walk through the door of a psychology office or psychiatry office want to have that connection in some way or figure out how to get it better most. Right. Most. Because of what it does, as we talked about for the uh, kid with attention problems, video games is such a relief for him because the noise floor drops. Right. It can be a relief for people, but it can also, again, I challenge you, you're, talk about your two or three best moments. You can get into those moments all the time Right. where you can drop everything for a while. And listen, if you decide to go sit on the deck and look at the stars and have a drink for a half an hour, all those things that are bothering you, tagging you, nothing's going to collapse in that half an hour. Right. Your mind is going, no, you got to do this, you got to do that. Do I really? Right. For a half an hour, I can do this. Right. And the ability to do that, once you gain the skill to do that, it's so rewarding because right. it's less stress. It's Well, it's giving yourself the permission to do it so that you don't feel that the things that are pressing or the threats that you're generating on your mind are more pressing than the time that you have for yourself. Right. Um, you know, it's interesting because it's like a, a and lifespan first reward, development thing. Children, Babies and children don't have this affliction. Yes. Then they get socialized out of it. We all get socialized out of it for the most part. And then somewhere in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you start looking for it again to try to bring it back. And you spend the better part of your life, like most people I see, trying to get back to what came so easily and naturally. Kind of like the instinct of, of eating. Babies and, and, and young kids know when their body wants to eat. At a certain age, give or take a few years, through socialization and environment of the family and this, you know, whatever's around them, around food and all those other issues, it goes right to socializing them into you don't know, your body doesn't know when to eat anymore. You just do it out of comfort, out of environmental stress. So it's in same with alcohol, same with whatever it is. You Lost know. the Little League game, let's go get an ice cream. Right. Yeah. Well, right. And that's, yeah. and that's the big reinforcer is like don't reinforce your brain with things that could lead you down that bad path. Don't reinforce your brain with a cigarette. Don't reinforce your brain with food. You know, kids, people like, oh, yeah, you did a good job. Let's go get ice cream. Oh my God, you get it. Oh, it's dessert tonight. And you know, six out of seven nights, it's a reward. Well, now you're setting a person up for, for that. So rewards are great. Yeah. Like kids, stickers, when they outgrow stickers, then, you know, like a pencil, like things that, are stimulating to them at their age development, but not things that are going to give them a bad, unhealthy habit. Um, and that's the same thing with go to mindfulness and video games and keeping attentional and attenuating the focus is limiting back the screen media time for people in general because it's bad for the brain over and over and over again to have that much time. There was a very interesting piece yesterday, I think it was. In, to this point on um, I think it was on the Today Show so I'm sure you can go back and watch it on the Today Show either yesterday or the day before this woman <clears throat> has four or five kids and what she realized is when the pandemic started how little time and she started focusing how little time her kids and her family would spend outdoors and on average what she did she started this great foundation on Facebook and all this stuff and she's got tons of followers now and doing it but it's like the thousand plus hour challenge that getting your kids out of the house on at least a thousand hours plus a year so that they're outside doing something outdoors because what she was finding is that most kids only leave and, and it had great research and lots of social psych people backed it up and American Pediatric Association was backing it up seven and a half minutes outside is spent and kids don't have, you know, so we, and we know that going outside changes your mindset. It gives it, you know, talk about attenuating focus, right? You have to be present in nature. You have to be, you know, watching for yeah. environmental stimulus. You have to be interacting with people and connecting likely, or if you're alone, you know, hiking or, so this mom took her kids out and made my two or three hours a day, like making sure they were out in the rain, playing in the puddles. Another thing that all parents are like, don't play in the puddles. <laughs> she was like, play in the puddles. Let's yeah. go on a hike. Let's pack a lunch. Let's go to the beach and not like to sit. It was to go and be active. And this is, and so she, her, her, Self and her husband were a little overweight, and they realized that this is not good. We were sitting around and watching. So she's got this really great new Facebook thing for the past year, I think it is. 
So if you want to know more, I think if you go to Today Show, it's there. But it's about <clears throat> how she saw it in her own family and said, this is part of the pandemic problem. It's part of the generational problem in the past two or three generations of how we have so much um, lack of mindfulness, lack of presence, lack of what we're doing. You know, seven and a half minutes a day on, uh, as the average of how much time kids spend outside versus I think it was 10 to 12 hours is what she realized on social media and yep. stimuli of video games and stuff. She was like, enough already. Like, it's just un unhealthy, when you which were is young, clear. When you were young, how long would it have taken you to collect a thousand hours outside? Oh, easy. A like, month. A month oh, and like, a half. Yeah, easy. Yeah. Yeah. I was outside all the time. Yeah. It was, it, well, if I wasn't in the gym, which is still technically outside, because, I mean, I had practices for four to six hours a day, it, even when I was little, like six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven years old. And then when I wasn't, weekends were bike riding 26 miles, hiking, swimming. In the winter, it was still hiking or it was in the gym more for gymnastics. I mean, it was never not. And every kid I knew in my class, just about like growing up, Hockey, skiing, swimming, skating, tennis, golf. Mm -hmm. Everybody was doing it totally different. And you can see the differences now, even as them as adults. And like, I know I'm still friends with a couple of them. And they have kids and they kept that lifestyle. But you see now other kids that have come up around that. And in my area where I grew up, not like that at all. So, and of course, in my practice, that's one of the number one questions is parents come in and say, tell my son or daughter how much time they should be spending on. And I don't tell them. I just say, yeah. well, let's look at the whole picture. So it's reasonable because the whole thing is to get someone to be mindful, including a 12 year old. Let's think about how this is going to impact your life. How is it going to make your mindset less healthy? Um, and that's one of the things I liked about that book, the mid, the muddle in the middle. I don't know if you saw any part. Yeah. So they have a chapter somewhere in the middle. It's the muddle in the middle of how people get stuck in the mediocrity. That's how I sort of, you know, read it. And it's how to get through that and how to really make success even when you fear the failure. And if you do, and even if you don't have the purview of some kind of existence around you that's success based, because a lot of people don't have that. Um, I love that word attenuate today. They don't have the attenuated uh, focus of here's an environment to be successful because you have a role model to be successful. I see so many people that role, have role models that are meh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and, and have ones that have great role models, and, and but I'm, the ones that have the mo model that's, you know, mediocrity and, and give up mode and throw your hands up in the air and or the excuse makers of oh that I don't have to do that I'll do it tomorrow oh I can eat this today uh you know oh the doctor said this but I don't have to do that because you know I'm going to take this pill that is that is the mindset that I think that the genius of athlete book really speaks to about how to get people if they want to and that's the big thing is how do you get people if they don't want to to move in so that was one of my questions for them is how do you get people, given the book or whatever your techniques are, how do you get people to move past that point? Like, I know the answer from my perspective, but it would be interesting to hear, given what they've written and what they think is, because that's the hardest thing is, I can't get anyone to move, obviously. The person has to be yeah. wanting. And that's what I find, is that the factor between those who have the mindset that want the, the world-class mindset versus those who stay in the muddle of the middle, um, love that term that they use, is that the want isn't there. I want to parse. Well, they want to, yeah. and I air quote that. They want to, but eh, but they don't want to do the work that goes into it because the role modeling, so you back up, the role modeling just isn't there to set it up. It's like, oh, well, we give up. They I give want, up. I want to parse one of the words you used there where you were talking about successful, and you were yes. talking in the context of successful environments, successful uh, parts of their life, things like that. And the definition of successful is interesting because yeah. I think for me and the mental health definition of success, I think the thing that helps you the most is success is stuff that gives you a reward. Right. Whether right. that be peace, whether that be happiness, whether it be financial so you can do other things and have other options, lower your stress level about money, things like that. Success can have a number of things, but it's got to be a reward. If you can teach people to get into those reward moments right. more often, it's like a muscle. You, as, once you do it and once you can manage to do it on your own and you're aware of it, 
you can do it more often and for longer periods of time. Absolutely. And I, and I think that the concept of reward is, is an imperative word there because rewards are often, again, just like mindfulness, not really understood the continuum of what a reward looks like. There's so much on the reward scale that could be there to give you something. It's not an all or nothing. It's like, oh, I did something great. So it's Friday. I can have a drink or, you know, or, oh, I can have a big piece of cake. It's yeah. about, it's about giving yourself daily rewards. Is that, you know, making sure you spend five minutes with yourself and just listening to a piece of music. That's a reward or setting up time to go sit outside and have a coffee. Like rewards are not necessarily something you can tangibly touch, but people, um, commonly, and I'm always taking these things anecdotally out of my, my brain from my practice is people commonly have to touch. It has to be something tangible that you can see, taste, touch. That's not the way it has to be. It's just something that you're rewarding yourself by saying, ah, that felt really great. And so I'm going to take five minutes and I'm going to listen to a piece of music or I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to, you know, go out and, you know, talk to a friend or something. There's, it doesn't yeah. always have to be like food or um. money. I'm going to go back into the retail therapy. I'm going to go back into the Gita podcast I do, which is kind of interesting because I think what you're talking about here is the difference between pleasure and happiness. Yes. People chase pleasure. Yes. And which and confuse it with happiness. And confuse it with happiness. Yes. Pleasure chasing pleasure is ultimately self-defeating because you don't continue to get the same pleasure from something when you repeat it. And then right. when you don't have it, well, you, you always have to have more. That creates angst, right? Right. You're constantly in bondage to chasing that pleasure. Happiness, right. on the other hand. So that's the difference between having a piece of cake. And that's eating it too. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to. You just set it up. I couldn't I help know, it. I understand. That's the difference between having a piece of cake and finding a peaceful moment on the back deck. Right. 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 Cake is you eat it and it's gone. Right. So, well, and so the con so yes, yes, and yes, and that's great because what it, the concept I use, and I was just talking about this with a client last night, is the pleasure concept is you're filling your cup halfway up and then it's got a hole in it and it, and it, and it drains out really quickly versus when you're seeking happiness and you get happiness, the cup is filling up. There's no hole to empty because you're always just building on it and then in, in, in you're remembering it and you're associating it. And that's like to the top of the hour when we were talking about mindfulness is... The cup, people who have to fill the cup up constantly, 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 that's the concept of this piece of cake isn't, isn't going to be enough. Or even with running, right? So if, if I'm on a runner's high a lot and I've run a ton, mm -hmm. I, I have to pull it back sometimes because I'll run two or three times a day if I, <laughs> because that's what happens and it's yep. not going to help me. It's going to end up hurting me. And, it, and it, you can see it in, like, even some of the elite runners that are out there. And by no means am I an elite runner, uh, in my mind. So you can see that, like, people that do thousands of hours, their bodies struggle. I have a, I have a running colleague who has had hip issues, yep. had hamstring tears, because of the amount of strain that she puts on her body. And she is an elite runner. And, but it's the, that concept of constantly rewarding oneself with the same thing, but it's never enough. She's, it's, it's my concern for her is I often have said to her, by the time you're 60, you're not going to be running, right. not because I'm being negative to her, but I'm concerned that she doesn't have anywhere else to fill up her cup. And instead of it being like satisfied with the successes as defined by her that she's had, it's, you know, she's going to go straight to, and she has role models, by the way, that are parents that are in their 80s and pushing up to the 90s that are still running. Yeah. And so her role models are that this is what you do, which is fine. But it's just about that example is filling your cup up. This is what you do that much running or running that long? I mean, running yes, that late into their life. See above, that's what they, that they run, yeah. they've run for years. They, that's what they do. That's how they fill their cup up. That's what they've got. There's, I can't imagine that family not running. And they've got their little kids running it now coming up through. So, but for those types of situations, and this also goes to athletes, like right now I've got the, you know, a couple of football players and that are made the NFL in the past year. So they, they, they giggle at me because they'll be like, you're always so like down to earth about this. Cause I'm very point blank. Like this could end tomorrow. <laughs> They're like, I just made it. I'm like, this could end tomorrow. And that's fine. 
do not ever lose where you came from, where you are. Ground yourself because you have to have a plan. This cup will only stay right. full so long. Don't rely on this cup. And they're always like, Ugh. But I'm not taking it away from them. I'm giving them the sense that they don't get from the the world of sports or at that level around them is always like, they it tune out all the reality and just be like, go! And yep. I think one of the best things about Rob Gronkowski's family and his ability and Tom Brady and a couple other people that I could name, they're, it's, they're grounded. They have the family, they have the grounding, they have the role models. That Their cup isn't full in one spot. That they, they could stop on a dime. They don't need to be playing football. They Right? That's why Rob has walked away and come back. He doesn't need to do that. Uh, it, there's other things because there's other pieces going on in their lives. And I think when people get stuck in that one modality, whether they're, they're doing over-the-top intense sport or they're successful at work or they're trying to be, you know, a master craftsman, whatever it is, it's about making sure you have a sense of presence of what's really going on so that you're not constantly chasing the high of the moment, that you're seeking reality, that you're having flexibility. And those concepts for people go in and go, wow, that's yeah. so overwhelming. It's just easier to just kind of keep filling my cup up. But yeah. that's exhausting. You don't attach to it. Right. You can enjoy all, all of these things, right. all these pleasure things you can enjoy. But once you attach to it, then it becomes bondage. Then it becomes, mm -hmm. uh, it becomes ultimately self-defeating because then it becomes one of those other things that's competing for attention in your mind. They going back to that thing. I like, if you want to run four times a day, what are you thinking about when you're trying to do something else in your life? When you're trying right. to interact with your kids, when you're trying to interact right. with a friend, you're thinking about running. Well, and, and oftentimes when those things are happening. By the way, hi Greta, thank you for your comments. Um, and but when people are running or when they're doing the the thing that's filling up their cup, that's fine. But it, it's great actually because it's usually something healthy most of the time, unless we have other things going on. But but. It's also they're running from something. I mean, the metaphor right. of running is they're running from something. So when you're thinking about running that much and it's to the extent of people getting hurt or they're playing, you know, football players playing through concussions back. Remember just recently, I, I mean, ah, you have a concussion, go back out on the field, right? It's because we the, all did. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, so so take it to real life, you know, eating, eating the same thing. Oh, ah, I had that, now I'm going to have something else. Now I'm going to have something else. It's like passing the time because what are you running from? I mean, what is the underlying condition that's going on that makes you have the mindset fall apart, right? The world-class mindset is not perfect. And that's what people often think that are not athletes, I think, at that level. And what I've gained from all this work that I've done over the years is the mindset is that of, Oh, I can't be like that person. I wish I were. I'm like everybody can be like that. Everybody can have the mindset of Shaquille O'Neal. Everybody can it's there's I mean everyone's human. So you have the ability to go there. It's about where where are you in your head? What do you need to shift? Do you want to shift it? And the want versus need. I need to shift it versus I want to shift it. And the want has to be great enough because the pain in the in the in the mental space has to be great enough to have the want be able to be activated people do not have activation of moving forward in things or being more successful at what they want because they don't have the pain that's great enough yep. it's kind of like addicts who hit bottom you know people say well when are they going to hit bottom this is the common question in addiction when is my son going to hit the bottom i don't know and i'm like for him, it's going to be different than the last right. person that hit bottom. It could be that they have a DUI. It could be they run their car into a tree. It could be that they kill someone. It could be that they just have a bad night out and feel sick. I don't know what that is, but it's going to be when the pain becomes great enough for the want that they have to move forward because everybody wants to be successful, really. Sure. Nobody wants to fail. Everybody wants to do the, the best person that they are. They do. It's the fact that then it all this other stuff gets in the way of, is the pain great enough to move you out of the space you're in? And I can't, you know, it's... Can it, you unattach from what you need to unattach from to be successful? Right. Everyone wants to be successful, but it comes at some costs. Some, right. are, some are more dear than others, of course. And there's we have to sacrifice. Yeah. Sometimes pet sacrifice, and people don't like to sacrifice. And I want to throw a yellow flag up about this the basis of the conversation, which is getting into the mindset of world-class athletes. Right. Because world-class athletes are freaks. 
But hey. by, by definition. Oh, my God. By definition, I, they're freakish. To my listeners, I did not say that. I know you didn't say that. Uh, Tom Brady. Tom Brady's a freak. He's a mental freak. Well, he's very mentally intense. Yeah. Well, any world-class class athlete is going to be mentally intense. Right. About football, we don't know otherwise. Well, no, he's he's mentally intense around working out, being mindful, staying, and partially because he has a role model of a wife that is involved in that. Yeah. Right? But, but we don't know about his day-to-day. We don't know much about, we, we don't know about his mental state other than the public right. persona. Right, and exactly. football. But to be a world-class athlete, you have to have a, a mental approach that is somewhat freakish. You have to be very intense about it. You don't get there. Well, you, the drive. You just the, don't wander there. So as an elite athlete myself, mm-hmm. I can say that the drive that I have and the perseverance or the self-dedication and the self-drive, all the self-sufficiency pieces and the self-motivation, all that stuff, is very different than counterparts to me who are in gymnastics or who have run who quit or fall short or give up there's definitely a difference in how we talk how we see things our perspective um how much time we'll put in um like i have two like for instance uh, two football players both 16 years old i have one kid they're both on the same team locally i have one kid that will go in and do three times a day in the gym and work it and He's got good talent, but right, the other one has great talent, goes in hardly ever. I guarantee the one that goes in three days a week because of his mindset, the way he he just coach loves him. The other kid, eh, yeah. he's great, but that kid that puts in the time, puts in the work, wants it, really drives. Yep. His mindset is much more self-driven and less externally driven. Like you know, I'm not, he does the the selfish piece, the narcissism isn't there. Because he's doing it for himself versus the other kid that I see is doing it, loves the sport, whatever, but he's really doing it for accolades and people loving him and being the great football player that he is. And he just doesn't have the drive. So the mindset is different. Now, where they end up, I'm not sure, but yeah. that such a difference in the way a world class athlete at a young age is going versus a kid that's like, eh, you know, that that's, kid is and that kid is going to be the one that's 40 years old talking about his great play at 17 in the last football game. That's Not, the, no, no offense to that, but it's just like the mindset is totally different. The mindset is a separator for world-class yeah. athletes. I, and yeah. I'm going to talk about myself, and I know it's boring, but I'm sure a lot of people are in this situation. I played three sports and played guitar, too, and never maximized on any of them because I couldn't throw the other three things away to do the one thing and to be a world-class athlete you have to do that one thing right basically right like you want to play football and baseball no can't do that right unless you're daryl strawberry yeah remember daryl strawberry Uh, bo jackson yeah oh yeah but you know right um so just really quickly because greta is our uh, wonderful guest here today um who's joined in and giving great comments um she's talking about how you know extremely hard it is to get like middle school age kids motivated and stuff like that well so two things one if kids don't start with a with a good mindset and keep going through usually we know this time and again this has been for at least 30 years in research and i can say it it, personally i watch it around 13 14 years old is when kids will tap out of their sport and they'll quit and they'll readjust and do something else or they'll just quit altogether because they've lost the focus and they've lost the meaning of what the sport has for them for a variety of reasons which i could go into it for a whole show of why that happens but well, they, um for but, one thing they level up y- right and and the competition expands well so yes and so i remember my first college hockey session it was like what sport are we playing right it just seemed like that big a level jump right so you know? well so the so the expectations and all the things that leveling up brings right that and I've talked about leveling up with you many times about how what that brings, what the mentality brings for that. But the other piece of that, to Greta's point, was that kids aren't taught, and I try to teach my athletes, what is your why? Remember, you, I think that was one of my very first shows, 7,000 shows ago, yeah. right, in February of 2020. What is your why? If And you don't have to get into like an adult version of that question with a kid, but you do have to figure out for your own kid or as a coach, what, why are you playing? Not because you want to win. That's not a why. And if, if we go back to that first or second show I did on what is your why, it was about I do this because I 
want to feel good. Like I run because I want to feel good. I run because I, I run because I want to do the Boston Marathon. I want to get better at it so I can see if my time improves, which it has, right? I run because, or I, I want this because it's giving me something for me, not to win, to beat somebody. To, those are all whys, but they're not the whys that drive a mindset that's going to be world class. That's right. not at the basis of it. So when you have middle aged, middle aged, but middle school aged kids, we don't need everybody to get to a world class mindset. That's kind of, we don't need everybody to get to a world no. class mindset. No, yeah. no. What we because again, that's freakish. Right, <laughs> right. But so it's that's why I love that part of the book. It's not about getting people to be a world class mindset. It's getting people to come from the muddle in the middle of mediocrity of like being, eh, status quo feeling like you can't get anywhere, this is the lot in life, essentially, to being just a little bit better for themselves. It's not about comparative to the world. It's about you can be better than what you are just by putting in an activation point of what's your why? Why do you go to work every day? You know, that why was my, do you have a family? When I was a kid, when I was middle aged in high school, that was my why for sports. Right. Because I'm good at this. Mm -hmm. I can get better at this. I have some control here. I have some... You know, I'll say it, I have some status here. Right. Right, which was different from the rest of my life, just being another kid in high school. Now, it's like, here, I, this, is, this is where I excel. This is where I'm not mediocre. Right. So when you said back then, you know, oh, this gives me status, right, that's great. My question as a sports psych person would be, how are you going to carry that over when the sport isn't there anymore? Right. How are you going to achieve the feeling that you get with the status here when you go to the next thing and the status isn't there and you either have to build it or it doesn't ever come? How, what is then your why? 16-year-olds aren't thinking. Okay. Right. Yeah. But 16-year-old but athletes that are moving up there or, or, or kids who are not athletes or who are valedictorians or who are great academicians or right. um, kids who are working or kids that are going off and doing humanitarian things at 16, the mindset is going to have that movement in it of the why. The why is because I enjoy it, because I like giving back. You can see it in the, in the dialogue of kids. Um, interacting with with me i i mean there's yeah. such a difference sometimes between kids who are really activated and being like i'm like why do you do it and they're like oh because i love how it feels i love giving back to the community i, I like love. this me there's always these things that yeah. are here versus well because i'm i'm awesome or um you know or because my parents want it or or right. the i don't know i get a lot of i don't why do you do it i don't know because I'm supposed to. Why? Yeah. Well, because if I quit, my parents will be mad. Yep. Ah, Wrong. Which yeah. I understand because I know that that feeling from being on all sides of the sports, right? That, yeah, doing it for the wrong reasons. And comes, the why, and that becomes that muddle in the middle of like, I can't get out of the way of my own self. It comes down to that healthy self-image, isn't it? Yes. Because people that are in situations that they like and enjoy, it's like, I like this me. I don't like the other parts of me. I, I like this me. When I'm on the field, when I'm on the court, when I'm doing this, when I'm in class, I like that. I like oh, that person. Yes. Well, I, was, I, was, I am listening to you. I'm reading Greta. Greta's yeah, got know, some great conversation. She, she coaches <laughs> because she's giving us her why, which is great. I coach because I want my students from, oh, boy, Imokali, Florida. I know she's in Florida, yep. but that's a lot of words. That's an Indian uh, tribe, obviously, like the... Um, Seminoles, maybe? Yeah, I think so. Um, to have a chance at playing in college, as I did, to maximize their potential and to have an opportunity to see the country. I mean, that is a why. That's a great why because it has multi-pieces in it. It's it's reachable. It's tangible. It's reasonable. It's It, it makes sense. It's So it meets the three R's, rational, reasonable, realistic. It gives a person flexibility, gives them incentive. It opens up opportunities for all kinds of things. Um you know, I often encourage kids that are finished. Like, I have a swimmer right now that she's not sure if she wants to stay in college swimming, to go to college for swimming. And I said, get in on a scholarship, go to college for swimming, see what it gets you. Because even if you don't stay in it, you can you can jump out of it, and then you'll get opportunities. You want to go into physical therapy. You want to be a sports medicine person. Like, all these other things open up. But I think you have to have a role model or an adult in the picture that has the mindset like you do, I do, and some other people to be able to, to push kids in this right direction, right direction as if it's, the, it is a good direction. It's the, it's a direction that's better than being sedentary and not going anywhere. Yep. You know, um, 
you know, I understand that people are like, oh, but I, I'll have my kid do their first two years at middle, you know, at, at a, a middle ground college for, a, you know, their associate's degree, it saves money. Yep, that's great, you know, for a lot of different reasons. And it also keeps them muddled in the middle. And some kids don't have the opportunity or choice to be able to go any further because their grades aren't good enough or their sport was not enough or whatever it was. But it, and so you have to do what fits your, your budget yep. and all those things. But don't short, short change your kid because this, the path is is leading them to what the next thing is coming. So if, if status quo and mediocrity is what you're laying ground for, the likelihood is that's what's coming, right? History will but repeat itself. You're depending on, this is going to sound harsh, but you're depending on parents to pass along a skill set that they don't have themselves. Well, yes. And or, they, or they do have it, but they don't activate it. Because I think a lot of people have it. I think a lot more people have it than realize they have it and have bypassed it or they do realize i see a lot of people that realize well, they have it and they just bypass it because it's easier people take everyone the easy has out. it but it takes work it takes oh god forbid work especially if Forget you're work well, that's too hard especially if you're in your 30s and you're just looping back around to this and trying right. to figure it out mm -hmm. because you know in your 20s you're just going along you're just figuring things out as you go right and you wear in these patterns some of the good some of bad but when you get in your 30s and 40s and, God forbid, your 50s, you start looping around to this mindfulness right. segment, it's, it's, it's no longer natural. It's, it's, it's difficult. And especially when you didn't have, I'll go back to you, role models. When right. You, when you didn't have parents who practice this, this kind of thing. Right. You know, my parents were workers. They were Western Electric. They right. got up in the morning, went to work, came home, did what they did. They did great. They right. were a 50s, 60s, you know, couple. Right. That's what you did in the 50s right. and 60s, right? Right. But you weren't passing on a lot of mindfulness from, from that situation. Well I, well, I think, but I think in some ways they were, just not with that word that they were, though. They were giving, a, a, they were laying groundwork for being self-motivated, showing by example, doing that we do things even if they're hard. We don't give up. We don't yeah. make excuses. I think there's something to be said for that because... They model the sense of responsibility yes, and purpose. and accountability that that oftentimes I see in young athletes and and people that aren't even athletes in my practice that just don't have that. And to activate that, like I can see it in the office, I'll build it up and I can see like a, a kid go out and be successful for a couple days and then the parent will come back and say, every time they leave your office after three days, they're like doing great. And then the last couple days before they see you again, they start to slide. And it's not because they're coming back to see me because usually there's, yay, I can't wait to see her again kind of thing because what I'm doing is I'm role modeling and building up and putting ground and then as soon as they leave, they don't have anything to support that environment. And so it You're enabling them. You're giving them the skills to right. to create these moments and these dynamics and right. then they once they wander away from it, they don't feel the support. But right. and they'll I, get stronger from doing that. Right, and I yeah. and I get that, and I get that feedback from some of the kids. They'll they'll you know they'll text me you know like after a game or or something they've done and say, hey, here's I did you know, but and they'll often say like, but I wish I had I wish I had played closer to when I saw you because I I had it, and or they will say things like you know when I'm around my home or my family, I get very demotivated and I drop into what they're doing. I need to do something else, but they're stuck. So it's just rebuild. It's like so it's like a weekly rebuild. <laughs> Yeah. of self-esteem around me being like a cheerleader, the coach, the the parent, all these things, because it's all built into that to be able to say, here's your But the your more strengths. times they repeat that cycle, the easier it gets for them. Yes, we would hope. It's that, training. I mean, that's in theory, yes. It's, it's basically training. Right? Exactly. It, there's not, you know, we're told by um, TV all the time, you know, all our favorite TV shows have the uh, session with the psychologist, and you go in for a session, and you come out, and you're fixed. Right. And that's not the way this works. No. It's training. It's, no. It's, 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 Which is what people it's expect. It's ongoing training, right? Right. The epiphany. We're told on TV and the movies there's an epiphany. Right. And there aren't epiphanies. Right. Oh, they're ra there's very aha, rarely. There's aha yeah. moments. Yeah. Aha moments get you moving sure. further, faster, better, but it doesn't. you still have to do the work. That time when something is presented to you, the same principle is presented to you over and over and over and over again. Right. And then there's that one that lands. Right. Because it's the right language it's the right circumstance you're in the right space whatever it is there's one time you hear it and it lands and I, and i think that that is really what the a lot of the base of what mindfulness is that yeah what you just were talking about what i was saying about just all those pieces building and knowing what it's called is a great thing but at least acknowledging and being present to know that building skill building scaffolding being able to go forward making sure you have a, a structure underneath you um 
by reinforcing it, you know. That was funny for me. There was this time when I was learning this and trying to apply it and learning it and trying to apply it and learning it and trying to apply it. And then at a certain point, I just realized, hey, I'm doing this. And I don't remember when that happened. And yes. It's like, wow, I, that would have bothered me a long time ago. Or, you know, it's it's there's not that uh, for me, there wasn't that moment where all of a sudden, oh, I get it. Ha right. ha. It was like all of a sudden I'm just doing it. Right. It was I was doing it. By rote, I was thinking about it and being aware of it while I was doing it for a long time, and then I was just and then, then I was become, just well, doing it. And yeah. so that's the whole premise of of doing therapy, that's solution focused and cognitive behavioral therapy, like the the programs like Noom and the programs like I do, like I have my own little pace program, which is all that is you get people to be present so they know by rote, like or that they're habit building, habit building, and then all of a sudden it's like they let go and it just becomes natural. Because everything that you're doing up until the point where you come into a room like mine to see me or you're doing, you're doing a habit that you formed on your own doing the same thing. I'm basically teaching you how to unlearn what you learned by teaching you what you did in the first place to get you to the spot that you were yeah. in. And it took you and years And so people to get actively the, yeah. go into the negative spaces and then go, I can't, I can't do that. I'm like, yes, you can because you did this. Yeah. This is, this is the exact same place you'd be in. But better if you did this that way for that. It, it took you years to get into those patterns. Right. It takes time to get out. Right. Well, that's what I say to clients. It's, it took you years to, you know, 30 years to walk into the woods. Um, but it's not going to take you 30 years to get out. But you nope. have to follow the path back. And, you know, it may take a couple years. It may take, you know. And then people like to maintain the ability to keep out of the woods. But it's very overwhelming when... You know, first get a client in, they expect five sessions, I'm going to be fixed. I'm like, in a year from now, <laughs> we'll have a different conversation because they'll say, when do you think? I'm like, well, in a year from now, we'll see where you're at. And like a year, yeah. you know, then five years later, they're like, oh, my God, I've had all these progress, you know, because you review the progress. And people say, oh, that's so long for therapy. But it's not traditional therapy. Traditional therapy actually would be your lifelong and sitting on a couch with Freud. But it's it's about building skills every day it's not about fixing one problem it's about rebuilding your whole mindset around yeah. that's i mean really that's what i'm doing is i'm coaching a mindset constantly for people to get them into their better selves which is to the point of the book of the people that aren't here today the other thing about Did it you is that? you're more or less yeah, you get back at him <laughs> you just got that in <laughs> just one more time uh, your mindset is the result of all these things that you're swimming in Right. At the time, exactly. all your influences at home, your friends, work, right. w whatever you're doing, it's a result of all that. And one of the things, the, one of the reasons I kept going uh, for therapy for as long as I did was, and I now go back again at some point, is because just getting out of that pool right. for a little bit while and being able to talk to somebody who's at a different level of, right. of thinking differently. Because you, you naturally assimilate to everything that's around you, the thought process is behind you. Right, perspective so you, shifts. You do what's you do what's ex, you do what's accepted, right? And what's expected. You just tend to start thinking that way, right? Well, and, and because you get positive and negative results depending on how you interact with people. So getting outside of your circles and talking to somebody, you know, working at a different level, mm -hmm. is just mind clearing. It's just. Well, I was having a conversation to that point uh, with a client last night about, you know, want versus need, should. So he was talking about like he should he do something that was based on something in his family and I said do you want to and he said no and I said well then you, the should shouldn't shouldn't be there because you don't want to do it and I said why do you why do you want to do it interchangeably he goes he goes well it's because I'm supposed to because I feel obligated and I feel guilty if I don't and I said okay do you need to do it and he said well yes I said what makes you have to need to do this thing and he's like well I guess I don't really need to do it. I'm just supposed to do it. I said, well, who says this? He goes, well, if I don't, I'm a bad person. Or he said he called it a bad son. I said, who says that? Do, would you look at the situation and think if your child came to you and all this was happening, would it be that way? He said, well, no. I said, well, do you think any of your friends would think that? No. Do you think any person that you'd ask on the street would think that? No. Right? I said, well... Would your that, parents think that? Right. Well, this was about his parents. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And his, and, right? So his parent... And he's like, well... She, you know, the, the parent has a history of being passive aggressive and, you know, you know yeah. the deal. And so I said. Uses the bad son as a leverage. Yes. If, if only my children love me. Yeah. Right. And I said, when you hear that, you're being gaslit. 
is adding the fuel to the guilt that you're supposed to feel to then make you do something you don't want to do. I said, wouldn't you rather, and I use his kids as an example, like, wouldn't you rather have your kids come visit you for your events, your birthday, your holidays, whatever, wouldn't you want them to come visit you because they wanted to versus need to out of obligation? And he said, well, yeah. I said, and he goes, but my parent, I want to identify who it is, my parent wouldn't care. <laughs> yeah. I said, but that doesn't matter what they care about. It matters about, at the end of the day, are you feeling so much stress that it's making you sick because you're doing something you don't want to do because you're feeling forced out of guilt? Yeah. So it's, it's the same kind of thing. It's the mindset of, are you doing, are you at your job that you hate because you are there because it's just making you money and and because you feel guilty if you switch jobs or you're miserable or are you at the athletic level you're at because your parents are making you or your co you'd feel bad if your coach, you know, I have an athlete right now that's she's doing her sport and won't leave to go to a different gym partially because she doesn't want to get that coach mad at her. I'm like, oh, my God, there's so many other coaches in the world that are better than her. This yep. coach, Right. Ah, so, I mean, so this is a constant in my practice daily. I live this all the time. I live this in my head all the time. But it's, it's so to the point of the guy is wants and needs. Do I want to do this? If yes, then do it. If I don't want to and I don't need to, then there's no should. Shoulds are, ugh. Let me bring that guy to the observer position because yeah. what's happening is his ego is barking at him about yes. being a bad son. That's his mind. Yep. That's his yep. mind creating a threat and issuing uh, protection for the ego. Right. But that's not who he is. That's right. That's his reaction in his mind. You get in the observer position, you understand that the, the mechanics of that, right. and you can work around it. If right. you're swimming in your mind and all those feelings, it's hard to see beyond it. Right. Like a fish doesn't know he's in water. Right. Right? Right. You've got to understand, you've got to get in the observer position and say, that's not real. I'm not a bad son because I don't want to do this. Right. That's just my mind telling me this because it's protecting my ego. Right. And well, and that's, and that's, I mean, without it saying, being said like that, what my technique to him was at the time was, is it realistic, rational, or reasonable? Dr. Kim's three R's yep. to, to think that way, that you're a bad person or a bad son. I said, where in the reality of life would someone say that that would be bad? And he had a whole bunch of examples, but they weren't based. I said, but those aren't facts. Those are just things that you're speculating. Those are things that you think other people would think. And does it, any, is anyone paying your bills at the end of the day? Is anyone putting your kids to bed? Is anyone in your shoes? No. But it's this socialized thing that gets on your mindset that takes away from the freedom of having a better self life in general or the better, you know, the world-class mindset. You don't have to be a world-class anything, but it's, the difference between staying stuck and being able to move forward and have a better life because you're living for you versus yep. other people's happiness. Thoughts are not truths. Right. To put it in the, the situation of walking a dog, if you're walking a dog and your, your dog just starts barking uncontrollably, right. do you run for your life? Mm -hmm. No, you deal with, you deal with, the dog is, sees a threat exactly. and is putting it in front of you. But you yes. don't take that as gospel. You right. kind of re your intellect reasons it out. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So yes to all those things. Don't listen to your dog. <laughs> well, sometimes. Uh, well, you should listen to your don't cats. Don't let your dog cats... run your life. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, just really quickly. So one, Greta informed me. Yes, and I knew this, but she was putting up fun facts about where she's where she lives now because she's actually from Vermont, my hometown, one of my hometowns. Oh. Um, but now she's in Florida. And yes, so one of the current Patriots football players, as we know, um, is from there, um, J.C. Jackson. Jackson yeah. um, and so that's really cool. And uh, um, and she's she's a, uh, Greta, hopefully you're still listening, but she's she's been in Vermont in the past, I think, week or so. I don't know if she's still there, but um, she has kids that are athletic and stuff, so she's been running around on the lake up in Vermont and doing lots of athletic things, doing the things that we've been talking about today with her kids. She's big on doing that. And when I used to babysit Greta back in the day, I used to force her to get out of the house and go outside <laughs> with me. Oh, well, there you go. So it she, took. she's probably like screaming in her head going, oh, God. <laughs> and Kim would come to the house. I'd be, and I'd always be like, don't eat that. Don't eat that. And she'd sing. Sorry, Greta. I had to put that out there because you were so super stinking cute when you were little you still are but you're an adult now so i can't really say that but amazing how therapeutic a walk a, is isn't it what it's amazing how therapeutic a walk is isn't it yeah yeah 
Just oh, she up. said, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I used to feel bad, I think, when I would leave. I'd be like, God, I rode that kid so hard. But I was like, <laughs> don't eat that. Stop. Stop it. Stop it. So, but Greta's awesome. So Greta, thanks so much for listening today and adding your two cents worth in because it was actually really important to talking about... Um, getting kids to find their why or people in general to find their why brings you back to the basics of, you know, the being present in the moment and, and getting a mindset that actually moves you forward versus one that gets you stuck. So hopefully I'm getting ready to sign off here, but hopefully in the next <laughs> week or two, we'll see. Oh, I will have our guests back and hopefully they will get their scheduling better and whatever. To be honest, so, we, we booked them past their book tour, too. So uh, Yes, we booked them past their book tour, so this was going to be a special. But they're still selling books, yeah. Um, you're very welcome, Greta. And, um, and, and hopefully they will not bail on us, and they will follow through, because I think they'll be great to have on, and, yeah. and we'll ping them. We'll to be fine either way. We, we will. I will be fine, <laughs> Lou. Lou loves to bust on me. I love it. I'm not busting on you. That was At encouragement. At the end of the day, Tonight I will sleep fine. When I get off air, I'll just come over and beat you up again. All right, cool. Like I did when I came in today. I <laughs> slapped him. I'm like, I can't believe it. So anyway, you guys, it was, a, it was a fun show for me. And thank God I got to read the book and, and listen to it. it. actually enhanced my practice. I will be now torturing all my clients with more of my stuff, mm-hmm. even more. So Check out God. past episodes. Come visit us next week. Yeah, absolutely. So all right, you guys, have a great week and enjoy the summer. All right. 